let's go ahead and get started. So now, good afternoon. Again, today is July 2nd, 2020. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. I am Phil Santonzi, Director of Client Engagement Services at Florida Makes, and I welcome you to our Florida Makes webinar series. James, can you give me a hand with the um, moving this forward, please? Doesn't seem to want to react. Well, he's doing that, I'll keep talking. We'll go to the next as well. So Florida Makes is the Florida member of the MEP National Network. MEP is the Manufacturing Extension Pro Partnership Program, which comes out of the US Department of Commerce and the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Uh, we are the Alliance Network in Florida of the Regional Manufacturers Associations here in the state. Our mission is to improve the productivity and technological performance of Florida's manufacturing sector. If you'd like to know more about us, please just check out our website at www.floridamakes.com. And okay, so you can move it ahead, please, uh, James. Two slides. Okay. So as I said earlier, if you were uh, were on at that time, as a participant, your audio will be in listen-only mode using the phone or your computer. Uh, there is an opportunity to ask your questions during the uh, during the webinar. You can use the question window, please, that you'll find in the panel. Add your questions there. We'll address those as time allows uh, during and at the end of the presentation. This is a live webinar event, which will be recorded. A link to the recording will, will be provided to you within a few days. Again, this is the second in our five-part series of Industry 4.0 webinars, Additive Manufacturing, Robots, and the Future of Manufacturing. You'll learn how uh, advances in automation are affecting the modern factory in terms of technology, quality, and human resources, and how you should pre prepare for those inevitable changes. You'll also hear about uh, Siemens Additive and its capabilities in additive manufacturing. There will be a discussion of the pros and cons with examples for implementing additive manufacturing called AM, which I'll use here from, from now on, in a, in a production environment. AM has commercial implications related to product design and fabrication. While AM allows freedom in the production environment, the challenges must be understood in order to implement in the appropriate conditions. In this session, uh, the importance of the differences between multifunctional and designed for additive manufacturing uh, will be discussed. Future webinars in, in, in this series will cover cybersecurity, augmented and assisted reality, simulation, big data analytics, the cloud, industrial internet of things, and horizontal and vertical system integration. Now to today's presentation, Industry 4.0, Additive Manufacturing, Robots, and the Future of Manufacturing. Today's speakers are Mr. Sean Dotson and Mr. Tad Steinberg. So first, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Sean. Sean Dotson is the president, CEO uh, of uh, R&D Automation in Sarasota. He's a Florida native and received his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from uh, the University of Florida. Go Gators. Sean has been in the, in the industrial automation and robotics industry his entire career. He's a licensed professional engineer in the state of Florida and works as R&D CEO and, uh, and CTO to build strong manufacturing partnerships with high technology manufacturers. This keeps him busy. He has retired from triathlons ranging from Olympic to full Ironman, Ironman distance races, but has the itch to try just one more. Good luck, Sean, and welcome. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, thank you everybody for, uh, <clears throat> for joining us. Um, again, my name is Sean Dotson, the president of uh, R&D Automation. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, robots automation and uh, humans in, in the future of employment. So we're gonna kind of really discuss, uh, um, not really the, the super technical aspects of the automation, but how automation is affecting uh, in, employment in our, uh, in our uh, current, uh, current uh, economy. Um, I'm gonna try to go to my slide, make sure this works. There we go, all right. So R&D Automation, uh, we are a uh, robotics packaging and assembly company down in Sarasota, Florida. Been in uh, business for about uh, 15 years. I've been in the industry for many, many more than that. 
Uh, we're the world's southeast largest manufacturer of custom automation machinery, uh, robotics, work cells, medical equipment. Um, we were the 2017 FANUC uh, System Integrator of the Year. Um, and uh, Florida makes, uh, we were a 2018 Florida Sterling Manufacturing Business Excellence Award uh, finalist as well. Um, so uh, if you're interested uh, in automation, you can just come visit our website. So I'm um, going to talk about kind of the, the big four factors that are going to shape the, the future uh, of, of employment. Uh, the, the first one there is, uh, you know, that our inability to compete is the greatest threat, not automation or robotics. So we're going to talk about how people talk about auto, robotics and automation are going to steal jobs. That's really not the issue. The, the inability to compete is the biggest, biggest issue. Um, you know, technology advances have and always will continue to change jobs. We're not going to run out of jobs. Um, so, you know, people are always worried about what are we going to do with all this uh, automation? Are we going to just be sitting around doing nothing? We, we won't be. We'll be busy. Next. Well, try one more time. Let's see here. Sorry about that. Keyboard being a little slow. There we go. Um, the other thing is, you know, if we focus on our fears, we're going to miss our opportunities. So, you know, a lot of times people look at automation and they're, and they're a little, you have some trepidation going into it. Um, you really can't, you, you can't focus on our fears. We've got to look at what the, what the advantages are going to bring forward. And then finally, uh, the skills gap it is real and it must be addressed. Uh, I think people have talked about this for the last few years, but we'll, we'll just kind of touch on it briefly again. So Sean, are you, um, uh, would you like to, uh, to ask the audience? Uh, yeah. A couple so, of questions? Yeah, so so Phil's going to uh, be popping up here a couple of little poll questions, just real quick, just to kind of give me an idea of, uh, of of what the audience uh, has has uh, their experience level. So, uh, James, if you want to go ahead and pop that up. Yeah, so our, our go ahead, Phil. I'll, I'll let you uh, ask these. Okay, so yeah, take a, take a few seconds here to to respond yes or no to the question: Does your factory currently have any high level automation? I'll give you a few seconds to uh, to respond. Okay, another five seconds. Okay, and so we can see that uh, 67%, two out of three people on the call say no. Okay. Okay, next question again, please answer yes or no. Are you planning on adding automation as part of your growth plans? Is it in your strategy? Go ahead and take a few seconds to respond to that, please. Take about another five seconds. Okay. Well, overwhelmingly, <laughs> yes. Uh, either the, only the yes is answered uh, or whatever, but uh, it seems like uh, everybody's got plans for it, which is good. good. And the, the final question we have here, I believe, uh, do you have concerns about automating your facility? And the, again, please answer yes or no to that. Okay, another five seconds. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, Fifty-seven percent say no, no concerns, which is which is good to hear, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, go ahead, John. Great. Well, um, so yeah, that, that helps me a lot. So it sounds like uh, you know, a decent number of you guys already have some automation. Um, all of you apparently are looking to add some more. And, uh, you know, about, about half of you have a little bit of concerns, um, but uh, hopefully you can address those. So, um, so you know, like I said, the inability, inability to compete is our greatest threat, not, not automation and robotics. Um, so, you know, here's a couple of little news items here. On, on the left, there's, there's some, um, you know, some, some, some uh, headlines, you know, evidence that robots are winning the race um, and how to survive the robot-fueled apocalypse, you know. Uh, robots are going to take our jobs. Over here, 
you know, robots are actually increasing productivity. Uh, robots are not killing the American dream. Uh, I think the humorous thing is that you'll see, you know, there's the New York Times on both sides, the Forbes on both sides. So, you know, the media can't even decide what what the, the true story is. So they like, uh, you know, they like a good headline uh, and just, uh, so what's the, you know, what, what's the real story here then? So, you know, this is some data from the RIA um, that shows industrial robot shipments and unemployment in the United States. And you'll see that it has an inverse correlation. So you can see that back at the uh, the 2001 recession uh, when unemployment, oh boy, uh, I guess it double clicked there. Um, let me try to go back one, sorry about that. Uh, there we go, all right. Um, the 2001 recession, uh, unemployment uh, ticked up there a bit. Um, and you'll see right after that, um, you know, robot uh, sales were, were increasing as well. Same thing during the, uh, the, the Great Recession uh, back in 2008. Uh, you know, it's an inverse correlation. The more robots there are, the lower unemployment is. It, it seems counterintuitive, but it's, it's proven itself for the last uh, couple decades. Um, we're going we're gonna to see the same thing uh, here very soon in the next uh, five or six years. The, this next recession that we're, we're probably going to be going into or already technically going to be going into, um, you're going to see robot sales you know, in, increase again. Um, so the benefits, you know, we the, the big the big thing of the of the three Ds. Um, you always want to look at automation when you've got dirty jobs, um, when you've got jobs that are uh, dangerous. You know, want to keep your your humans safe. Uh, you got jobs that are dull, all right, just very boring, you know, repetitive jobs. And I always kind of add a fourth one: is difficult to fill. It may not be a dirty, a dangerous, or, or dull job, but it's just jobs that <clears throat> you just can't seem to find people to do. Uh, for whatever uh, particular reason. So, you know, what does this mean for workers? Um, you know, by by most studies, we're gonna, we're talking about 15 million new jobs created over the next decade due to automation. Automation is going to create these jobs. Um, you know, there are going to be a, a good number of people who will be displaced or replaced by this automation. But there's there's new jobs, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. You know, there are jobs that didn't exist. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, like for example, you know, ro ro robot lawyer, some a lawyer who specializes in robotics. Um, the other thing is, you know, automation elevates the level, skill level of that incumbent worker. You can take a worker who maybe doesn't have a, a very high skill set and put them in charge of an automated piece of machinery, um, and it really, you know, one it increases their skill their skill level, but at the same time, it also increases their pride uh, in, in their job. Whenever we deliver a, a piece of automation, inevitably the operator they name the robot um, and uh, you know give the machine a, a funny little name, and they really they actually you know are, are happy that this piece of automation is coming into their uh, their, their facility. And um, quite honestly, you know most companies that automate are not decreasing their workforce. I, I tell people when I introduce myself at a, you know at a cocktail party when there's non-technical people, they ask what I do, and I explain what I do. Like, oh, you put people out of work. And I, I tell people this all the time. I've never sold a piece of automation to a company that was getting rid of people. It's they can't they can't keep up with the, the pace of the uh, of the hiring, and so they have to automate. So uh, again, technology advances always and will continue to change jobs. We're not going to run out of jobs. So um, good example of this is you know as Apple and Amazon. Um, both of them uh, have created over a million jobs in the past decade. Um, they both promised they're going to create another another million in less than five years, and, and based on their growth, um, it's probably going to be more than that. Um, again, we were creating new jobs, you know, titles such as predictive failure analyst and mechatronics technician. Those didn't exist ten years ago. We're going to continue to invent new jobs. Um, you talk, you look at how many people are employed by you know, Facebook and Instagram and, and Google and all that. And a couple of decades ago, those jobs didn't exist. There, there wasn't a, a position to fill. So we're going to keep creating new positions to fill. Um, a good case study of, uh, of how automation does not you know, decrease uh, employment is, is Amazon. Um, they added a half a million jobs in less than 10 years. And during that same time, their CapEx was 15 billions of dollars, of which a little less than half was equipment and automation. So they are spending, you know, almost six billion dollars on on automation equipment, 
but they're still continuing to create jobs. You can see the charts over here on the left of looking at how their workforce has grown at an unprecedented rate, at the same time still, still buying all this automation. Um, you know, both UPS and FedEx have been, uh, both announced you know, major automation projects, again, to keep up with uh, the demands that Amazon are, is putting on them, um, as well as you know, Walmart and Target and all the other online retailers. So, you know, with all those dramatic increases in automation, why is employment dropping? It's because automation helps build companies and it helps build the employment base. Um, the other important factor is that the, uh, the overseas wage gap is shrinking. Um, we, always, we always talk about, you know, exporting to China uh, or Vietnam or, or, or wherever the, the next hot, uh, low cost wage uh, country is. Um, if you look at the uh, the wage average uh, wage uh, for factory workers there in China, you can see they're on an exponential growth curve, whereas the United States is on a not so steep uh, linear growth curve. And you know the estimate is that by by 2030, China is actually going to outpace the the average wage, the, the dollar adjusted wage for uh, factory workers. So uh, China is not going to be the preferred preferred uh, uh, you know overseas uh, manufacturer. Um, Add in some of the, the the COVID issues with just the world shutting down and and some you know, travel and 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 uh, shipping issues. That's going to continue. Um, but if you just look at it from a wages standpoint, this is this is what's going to happen. And what's interesting is now China is now the largest robotic market in the world. Um, so again, they, they, their unemployment they don't have an unemployment problem. They've got an infinite number of people, but they also understand too they need to keep adding robotics and automation. So if we talk about you know focusing on our fears, we're going to miss our opportunities. We you know we 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 can't allow our our, our fears to get in the way. Um, this is kind of where we talk about uh, you know what's happening in the world right now. Um, you know, obviously, if you kind of look back uh, over the last uh, you know year and a half, two years even, as the chart shows here, it only goes back to January. Um, unemployment claims were essentially zero. I mean, we had an unemployment rate down to two three percent, which is Statistically, zero unemployment. Anybody who wants a job could find a job. Um, obviously, when uh, the the COVID pandemic hit, those uh, unemployment claims just just spiked, of course, right? But as you can see, they are starting to come back down on a on a fair, fairly quick basis. A lot of companies, um, I don't want to say overreacted, but they they uh, they took a they, they took a very dramatic stance um, to protect their to protect their cash. But they're bringing you know people back, but they're also realizing that you know they can't produce their goods if they don't have workers there. Um, people are starting to realize that you can't rely on just the human worker to to come to work every day uh, and produce these goods, especially in in a case where you've got you know mass mass sickness across uh, the country and the world. Um, the other uh, um, the other the other aspect of that is all the money being spent on per you know personal protective gear. You know, putting up, uh, you know, Lexan uh, shields between workers on assembly lines. You've got workers who are you know, right there on top of each other. And you, you can't have that in today's you know, today's age without a lot of uh, uh, a lot of personal protective uh, equipment. Um, automation allows you to disperse these these workers and have them, you know, as a less dense. Um, and you know, by all by all predictions, this is not going away anytime soon. You know, we're we, we're going to we're going to be dealing with this this. COVID-19 for at least another year and a half, perhaps another mutation that'll come out in, in, in you know, for COVID-20 or 21. Um, this is something, it's a new reality and uh, something that we're all going to have to deal with. Um, so this is a, you know, a survey that just came out in May, actually, and, um, you know, asked, talking about, you know, the, the COVID pandemic, you know, what, what trends do you expect to accelerate the most in your business? In the next three years, and, and you know, you can see the answers there. But look at number one. Number one is adoption of technology that automates human processes. That's automation. So nearly 80% of all manufacturers said they expect automation to accelerate the most in the next three years. All right. The next is the reversal of globalization, bringing things back from China, back from Vietnam, back from the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and things like that, back to the United States. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a, of, of a nationalism happening there, but at the same time, people are also realizing that they really need, they want their supply chains to be closer. 
They don't want to be halfway around the world. Um, so, you know, huge disruptions to supply chains. I'm, I'm sure a lot of manufacturers have been seeing those. Um, but as part of that reversal of globalization, you are going to have to look at automation and look at ways to, uh, you know, to, to uh, increase the productivity in your factory. So, you know, as part of that, people talk about robotics and all, and they think of it as a machine sitting off in the corner. But, you know, um, something that uh, is kind of a little bit of a buzzword right now, though, is, is, is cobots, collaborative robots. And the idea behind the cobots are that they work alongside humans. Um, they, are, they are moving in a, in a manner uh, with sensors that if they do collide with a human, they're going to stop before they hurt that human. Now, that does not mean that you can just take a robot, a collaborative robot even, and throw it to an application. If the end of arm tool has a blade on the end of it, for example, or something like that, now you've got a robot wielding a knife. It doesn't matter how, what kind of force you have, you know, when it hits a human, it stops, it's got a knife on the end. It's dangerous. You've got to do risk assessment. But when you're talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, operations where humans need to get in and work with the robots, these collaborative robots are really starting to, uh, to come into their own. Um, it is still a little bit of a buzzword uh, right now. Um, I'd say a little bit uh, jokingly that Cobot, so the 3D printing of the late 2010s and, and, and TAD, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I think everybody remembers back you know, when 3D printing first came out, it was like, oh, everybody's gonna have a 3D printer in their house and you're gonna print a doorknob if you break it and all that. And Well, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. Not everybody has a 3D printer. The same thing with cobots. Everybody, you know, the manufacturers like, hey, this is the best thing in the world. Everybody's going to have one. There are certain applications where that makes sense, but not not everyone. So, um, you know, this is a technology. It's just something that people need to be watching. But at the same time, it's not the uh, well, it's the it's the newest, neatest technology. It's not always the right technology. So finally, you know, the skilled gap is real, and it has to be addressed at this point. <laughs> um, you know. Manufacturers have said that our workforce is not skilled. So you can see here, uh, based on uh, you know percentage of the executives that say their workforce is missing one of these particular skills, you can see uh, it's up in the high 60s and 70 percent for technology, computer skills, basic technical training, you know, problem solving skills, and basic math skills. You know, we really need to have a workforce that is trained that is a skilled workforce. Um, we cannot have unskilled workers. You know, how can we help that? Well, we've got to narrow, we've got to narrow those skills gap. And a lot of that's through the STEM uh, type education, right? So, um, you know, from 2009 to 2013, STEM jobs outnumbered the unemployed from two to one. So by just going and getting STEM training, you had a, you had a, you had a two to one chance better of getting an employment. Um, they're going to grow 17% through 2018. It's a little bit of a data statistic. Based on what I've seen, though, that, that number is holding steady at 17 to 20 percent. Um, we're also going to see a fallback in that traditional four-year university education track over the next 10 years. Uh, the cost of that four-year uh, um, you know, degree uh, is turning a lot of younger workers and even, and even workers who are going back to school. You know, somebody maybe who's in their you know, late 30s, or early 40s, they want to go get some skills. They really aren't looking at a four-year university anymore. They're looking at um, a, a two-year training program to learn to be a machinist or an electrician or a plumber or HVAC or something like that. Um, and more and more employers, I mean, including ourselves, we're, we're actually starting to offer more in-house training versus relying on the educational system. Um, so we can give people very specific niche training for what we want them uh, to, to, to learn and, and mold them so that they become you know, more valuable employees for us. Um, this is really the bottom line, and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a harsh statement, but it's a true statement. If you do not have a skill in our current economy, you will become irrelevant. It's like, again, it, sound, it sounds harsh, but the way our economy is going, you have to have a skill of some sort. You have to go to school. You have to get training, whether it be on the job training or, or, or a two-year degree or a four-year degree or even just certification. People have to get skilled, and there, and there are so many programs out there already that are offering, you know, free or reduced cost on, on this training. We have to encourage our employees to go out and, and get trained. Um, it, it, it helps us as employers, and it helps the manufacturing environment as a whole. So uh, I tell people this all the time: you've got to go get training, go get education.
So just in, you know, in closing, the important part, uh, the important uh, points that I'm just trying to leave everybody with um, uh, is, you know, the inability to compete is our greatest threat. Not I mean, automation or robotics. Automation and robotics is not going to kill uh, employment. It's it's not being able to compete with other countries. That's going to really be a, the biggest threat. Um, you know, technology advances will continue to change jobs. In 30 years from now, the job market's going to look completely different than what we than what we see right now. But um, it's it's not going to uh, it's not going to kill uh, kill the employment off. Uh, there's an old uh, story about uh, the invention of the automated teller machine, you know, the ATM machine. Oh, that's going to get rid of all the teller jobs. We have more tellers in the United States, you know, human tellers now than we did 30 years ago. So the ATM did not kill the the the, uh, the human teller. Um, again, we can't focus on our fears. We can't be afraid to to make mistakes. We need to go out. Sometimes the automation that you put in, you know, it it, it doesn't. It doesn't solve the problem that you thought it was going to solve in your manufacturing environment, but it doesn't mean that it, it was a mistake. Um, it means you can learn from those opportunities. Um, and we also have, can't be you know, fearful of, of what it's going to do to our, our business or our employee is going to resent it and all. You, you have to just move forward. And then finally, it's the skills gap. You know, it, it is real. It has to be addressed. We really need to uh, train our workforce um, and uh, to help grow the United States manufacturing, pulling it back from, from overseas. Um, I really see um, once we get past some of this COVID issues, it, we're going to see a surge in United States manufacturing in, uh, in 2021 and, and beyond. So I think, I think it's, it's really going to uh, surprise us how much more, how much we can manufacture in the United States. And that is uh, all I have. Um, I, I've got a slide here for questions, but I think Phil was going to, you know, Thanks. maybe wait until towards the end. But if, uh, Phil, I'm going to kind of hand it back over to you. If there's any questions, happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, you know, we can go on to, to Tad's presentation. Okay, thank you, Sean. And yes, I do have one question for you. And as a reminder to our audience, the question pane is open. Uh, will remain so for the rest of the, the session, and you may add uh, additional questions there. But I do want to get one question in right now, if I could. Um, as a manufacturer, what's the biggest obstacle I might have, as you know, in uh, in adopting automation and robotics in my uh, in my factory? Um, so probably the the the, the biggest uh, obstacle you might have is not having people on your staff that are uh, willing to be trained or are trained in um, some basic troubleshooting. Um, so, you know, a PLC program, they don't have to be a PLC programmer, but it, you know, have some knowledge of it, electrician, um, a, a good mechanical maintenance staff, um, because just like any other piece of machinery, you know, things do become out of adjustment, things do go wrong. And unless you take ownership of that equipment, that's a problem. So if you really are wanting to automate your, your factory, you are going to have to add people um, who are able to maintain and operate this equipment. Um, so uh, we have seen some people before buy very complex pieces of equipment and they don't have the staff to help maintain them. Um, and then they end up calling us you know, to help all the time, um, which we're happy to do, but uh, you know, you've got to take that ownership at some point. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Um, I, we may have some more questions for you as we have time uh, later, uh, but uh, I'd like to move on to uh, to Tad Steinberg. So Tad, Tad is the manager of the Siemens Additive Manufacturing, the AM Business Development, Marketing and Sales. He's an Air Force veteran and brings 20 plus years of aerospace hardware and systems engineering, development, testing and qualification experience, which includes defense, civil and private aviation. As the manager of AM Business Development, his areas of responsibility include creating solutions for customers, training, identification, and application of engineering needs, and communication of the realities of AM. With the recent opening of the Siemens Additive Manufacturing Application Center in Orlando, Tad now leads the business development activities for the Americas. Welcome, Tad. Thank you very much, Phil. I really appreciate the uh, introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to be able to uh, speak today. So um, I'm going to be talking about additive manufacturing. And a, a lot of you know, or that's a big buzzword, 3D printing. Uh, there's, there's lots of nuances to it. And you can do it in many different ways. Um, so 
how do I figure out which way we, we wanted to go with what we wanted to say or present today? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on metal additive and I'm gonna do an overview of, of kind of what additive is. And I will uh, see if this works, yeah. Uh, we'll kind of go, go through what it is um, and then a couple of different areas of focus for uh, today's presentation. And then um, uh, I'm gonna pare it down or, 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 or uh, narrow it down to just two different types of additive manufacturing. Um, then I'm, I'm gonna do a few things, um, uh, out, I'm gonna put a few things out there with regards to, is it right? Uh, what are some of the, the, what's the hype about? Or what are the realities around what can you do or what you shouldn't do? Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of who we are from a additive manufacturing perspective from uh, Siemens and Siemens Energy here in uh, or Orlando, Florida. Uh, I do think we have some poll questions as well that um, yes. please please jump in or interrupt. Wanna do those now? Go ahead, or? Go ahead James. Okay, so the first question is, are you currently using AM in your facility? And there's a couple of yes answers. Yes, in, entirely, or yes, but not in production. No, or no, but we are thinking about implementing. Go ahead and take some time here to, uh, to, to click uh, your preferred answer, please. We'll take a few more seconds. Okay, let's see what we have here. So 63% um, no, but we are thinking about implementing. That's the, the highest response. And then a, a plain no is 25% of the group. Uh, nobody said yes. And 13% uh, said yes, but not in production. Very well. Okay. That, that's, that was really good to, to know. Um, it's not right for everybody. And uh, it's it's kind of like uh, going into the military. It's not right for everybody, but there there are depending on your applications of 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 uh, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, maybe there's some some benefit there. So let's start at the beginning. What is additive manufacturing? Well, in, in essence, it's the the opposite of of subtractive. Uh, that sounds sounds really kind of silly, but um, instead of taking material away, you're adding it to where you need it. So the ASTM uh, has some standards around it, um, what those general principles are and what the technologies are. Uh, it also defines, you know, different set, basically seven different categories of additive, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, and then SAE has some, some um, requirements or specifications for the 7000 series, 7003, 7004, things of that nature. And they cover products or processes, uh, powders, and, and different types of AM. And from a high level, right, what is it, right? Well, it's, it's not the thing that's gonna to, uh, uh, replace all other manufacturing. Uh, it, it won't, at least not in the, um, in the immediate future or near future. Um, it is a complementary process to subtractive and you'll see why in, in a little bit. Typically it's suitable for smaller production runs, um, high mix, low volume, not always, but but oftentimes a lot of R and D. Um, so the other nice thing about this here is you can have a printer and have it in a remote location somewhere uh, to print whatever you need. Um, I was just in a uh, Navy symposium where they had uh, additive or printers on the on uh, submarines and ships where they're making um, tools and unique things that they would have to wait six months otherwise before they went back to to a base to get. So it, it, uh, it can play a pivotal role in, in creating solutions with what it, wherever you're at. And oftentimes casting is seen as a, a cousin to additive um, from, um, from an additive perspective, right? You're adding volume to wherever you need it, you know, via a uh, mold, if you will. So it is somewhat of a, a, a distant cousin, if you will, and we'll get into a little bit of that. Uh oh, too far, sorry. Still getting used to the presentation. So as we talked about, uh, there are basically seven different families of additive manufacturing. Um, 
some of you might have might have heard of something called stereolithography, right? So or bat uh, photopolymerization, uh, powder powder bed fusion, which we'll talk in detail about binder jetting, right? Where you uh, basically put put materials together and it's held together by a binder of sorts. Material jetting, sheet lamination, material extrusion, and directed energy deposition. Now there are others others with this, or maybe a hybrid type where it might it combine two or three of these into a hybrid type additive manufacturing system. And those, those exist as well, right? But keep in mind, not every solution is, is going to fit everybody's needs. So uh, knowing that these are out here, being able to, to understand what they are and understand uh, where be, between metals and polymers as well, um, we're going to focus on metals today, but all of these can apply to polymers in some way, shape, or form. So we're going to talk first about powder bed fusion, uh, metal powder bed fusion to be exact. And there's lots of different names that you could uh, hear for powder bed fusion, um, selective laser sintering, DMLS, uh, whether it's metal laser sintering or solidification. Um, multiple different names. So basically it's it's the idea of powdered metal being um, processed layer by layer. Uh, we'll go into the strengths and, and uh, pros and cons in a, another another slide itself. So to kind of describe what what powder bed fusion is, I, I like to think uh, pictures worth a thousand words, a video is worth a thousand pictures, and experience is worth a thousand videos. Well, you can only, I guess, take that so far. So I like to do a little bit of animation and, and ideas of what these are. Um, as you can see on the left, you have a powder stock, you have the part in the middle, and you have a recoder arm going across the, the uh, powder, or excuse me, the uh, uh, part in the middle. And the laser um, solidifies layer by layer that part on a on a certain level thickness or layer thickness um, during the process. Uh, the left is an animation. The middle one there is actual work uh, of a build chamber, and you can Google a lot of these. But if you look at the bottom, right, you, it really first starts off with your design. Your design, computer uh, uh, aided uh, CAD, uh, computer aided design, and that 3D image or that 3D model. And this the transition of that 3D model through something called a slicer. And if, if any of you guys have um, uh, some personal printers at home, a slicer would be something like Cura or Magix or a number of other um, uh, programs that do just that. And that's transitioned into the printer itself. You can kind of see the wireframe diagram on the top and each particular slice of that diagram is built in a section. The laser outlines that section and it continues the process over and over until the final part is built. If this is review for some of you, I, I, I know that a lot of people know this, but for some that may not have this, this understanding, I think it's very beneficial to understand what you're doing here. Now with this, it comes with, with pros and cons and, and uh, things that, that can be good for, for additive manufacturing or some things that, that aren't quite as good. Um, some of the pros here in green, capable of very high and highly complex geometries. Think about internal blind passages that you could no longer, you can't get to as a machine, or you'd have to have two parts and bring them together, whatever that might be. Complexities. As I said, some kind of a blind passage or a blind hole or something on the inside of a part. Very, very complex, highly geometric, uh, geometrically complex, complex materials, uh, shapes, excuse me. You can print net shape parts. You can print a part such that you pull it off the printer and you can use it in a, a functional environment. Let's say a duct of some kind, an aerospace duct, you know, or a bleed air duct, or maybe a valve body, whatever that might be. But oftentimes you will need some post-processing. That's a, a very key factor in understanding additive manufacturing. They are, they do have somewhat of a small build size. So that is another uh, hurdle. So 
they're working on a larger and larger platform every year. Um, they, you come out with bigger and bigger machines, um, but at what cost, right? What kind of uh, resolution do you get from a larger machine, a larger laser spot size, those kinds of things? They are a pretty much a dedicated and sometimes quite expensive to get into the uh, the uh, laser powder bed fusion game. And things are taken into, into consideration for post-processing. Well, the part is laser welded to a to a uh, base plate. Well, if it's laser welded to the base plate, it's got to come off the base plate. There's going to be some support structures in there uh, to come off the base plate at minimum. Uh, oftentimes, you'll go to a heat treat. Not always, but oftentimes you will. Um, machining, surface finishing, plating, and any anything else that the part needs to, to get to its final um, configuration. And it can be pretty expensive. So you really have to weigh those, those uh, attributes if it's going to work for you or not. Some of the other considerations, so how big or how small is the laser and how precise do you need, right? Uh, geometry of the metal powder. So finer powders versus uh, less fine powders can give you different features on your, on your part. Does it matter? Layer heights. Well, layer heights, the lower the layer, layer height, the better the uh, surface finish on the part, but it takes much longer to print. A larger layer height, worse surface finish, but maybe you can live with that takes a, a takes a less time to print. Some of the other interesting things, dimensional accuracy, usually around um, 8 thousandths or, or 200 micron. Surface roughness, again, it depends on your layer thickness and powder makeup, but uh, somewhere in the, in the range of two to 400 uh, micro inches. And layer thicknesses, sometimes you'll see uh, down below 20, but Typically, industrially, you'll see somewhere between 20 to 80 micron. Um, most prints seem to be done around the 40 to 60 micron range. Um, it gives you a, a good resolution with a with a OK speed as well. So those are some of the um, the uh, uh, kind of typical uh, parameters that you'd see within uh, laser powder bed fusion. Now, laser powder bed fusion is what Siemens um, is really focused on in Orlando, which we'll talk about more in just a little bit. The next family of uh, 3D printing I'd like to talk about is directed energy deposition. Uh, it's, if, if we have any welders in the uh, audience, it's very similar to welding, right? And it, it welding could be considered, right? A directed energy deposition. Um, so we have here on the right, it's uh, basically, it's a powder feed with a, uh, uh, di a diode laser, if you will, melting and building up material on a particular part. Uh, a lot of times DED can be used for repair as well. Um, very, very seems to be very popular in, in the industry. Putting in a particular part uh, after you've machined off what needs to be repaired and being able to uh, build up those particular surfaces. Off now, now oftentimes DED, directed energy deposition, um, it, it, it can be good and it can be challenging at the same time. They have very high build rates considered uh, compared to some of the other additive manufacturing uh, processes. Uh, they are very dense and very strong, so it, it does have good uh, material characteristics. It is a near net shape part, so very often you will not get a final product afterwards. You'll have to do some kind of post-processing, uh, whatever that might be, smoothing or, or finish, finish machining or, or um, whatever, again, whatever that might be. Um, it is a lot larger build chamber, which is kind of nice. It can be a larger build chamber. Um, easy material change. You don't have to worry about all the powder in, that you have in a particular machine. Uh, so that's kind of nice. The other, the other nice thing here is if you have a five axis or four axis uh, CNC machine, you can incorporate um, a, a head, if you will, a DED head, uh, geometry on your existing in, into your existing machine, so that can also um, give you some some flexibility and capability if you already have that cap if you already have those machines in work. Uh, it can be a high capital cost depending on how you're using it. Of course, pretty much anything in additive can be a high capital cost from that perspective. Um, low build resolution, as I'd said, and uh, it does have some some. Uh, limitations from a uh, overhang or a support perspective. 
different types of DED, laser-based, electron beam-based, or plasma or electric arc-based, so or wire additive, if you will. And the layer thicknesses there are, are typically a minimum of, of 10 thou to uh, 100 thou. This is kind of a, a nice chart to be able to, to show when does additive really apply? When does it, when does it make sense to deploy additive uh, versus conventional? And really, it comes down to quantity and complexity. And as I've stated before, uh, high complexity, low quantity is usually a sweet spot for additive. Now, this is changing all of the time. Um, as additive gets better, it's pushing the industry to, to um, uh, faster, better machines, but it's also pushing the, the uh, subtractive industry as well, which is great. We're just gonna, gonna make um, a better solution in the end. Now, this green part where it says complexity for free, um, we built a, a couple of these parts, I'm kind of hard to see, but these are header flanges. And imagine if you wanted to, to build a header flange um, and every single flange for every single cylinder, well, you wanted it bespoke, you wanted a different direction. Well, from a, a, mach, a standard machining perspective, this flange over and over and over, pretty simple. But if you wanted to build eight bespoke or 10 or 12, or how many cylinders you have of these, um, then it might be a little more difficult from a CNC perspective, um, meaning you've got to set it up each time with a different particular part. From an additive perspective, you can put every single one of these on a build plate and hit go. Complexity is free. Now, nothing's for free, right? But the idea behind that is complexity is free. Got a few existing parts that, I don't know if you can see them or not, but Right, some of these things that are definitely an additive uh, candidate. Um, here's another that I'm I'm showing here. I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is actually a filter. It's a 10 micron filter that goes in a gas turbine, and uh, it's printed in a 10 micron filter. It's a uh, it's nickel based, and it's a last chance gaseous type filter. So high complex. Usually parts are somewhat small. Um, uh, is a good candidate for that. Now, this is kind of an eye candy chart. I, I like to show this because it it shows the different influencers to getting a, a quality additively manufactured part. How many different things have to go into the to the process in order to get a, a good part? Now, if you changed any one of these, it's going to change the outcome. So it can be uh, quite a daunting task. So when you hear a lot of people ask, well, is additive right for me? And the answer that I always seem to give is it depends. It really depends. So it can be costly. I mean, I, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but the idea being um, there's a lot of challenges, but, the, but yet there's a lot of, uh, of rewards as well. Like for example, people, people will um, not always know or understand that you know, 10 to 20% of the cost of in the material is in the material. So the rest of the 80% of the cost is in the machine, the post-processing, the heat treat, or whatever else that there might be. Whereas in a subtractive manufacturing and you're milling something or machining something out of a block, right, you're somewhere in the range of 60 to 80% and the rest are chips, right? How do you move the, the, the mindset? And uh, I, I call that the gray hair factor, right? We all have gray hair. Well, usually that means we are setting our ways for subtractive manufacturing. It's hard for us to make that departure from, from how do we build something, how do we design something such that we can design it with additive in mind where we, we remove those boundaries. It's hard to get over that. It really is. Some of the other things to consider are if you have a part, piece parts, maybe 10 or 20 parts that make up um, one final part, uh, oftentimes those are good candidates. The down here at the bottom, this particular part was 13 parts and now it's one. Took 44 weeks to make traditionally, and now it's it's under, let's call it eight weeks to make that final part from an additive perspective. Uh, that part is a net finished part, no, no uh, post-processing required, for example. 
Uh, again, the sweet spot is high complex, uh, low volume. Um, another, another key takeaway here is part cost. Um, typically, if you're looking at part to part, if you're looking at part to part, the part cost will always, you not always, but typically be higher from an additive manufacturing perspective. If the part in and of itself can be made traditionally, it's likely going to be less expensive. But think about everything else in the life cycle of that particular part. And that's where people normally get, um, uh, they, they kind of get lost from that perspective. Well, if you take a part that took 44 weeks and now it's eight, what does that do to supply chain? What does that do to warehousing or lead time? What, is, what does it do to, to all the other parts that you had to make in order to make up this one part, right? So there's a lot of, of uh, things that need to go into your cost um, makeup to see if this is really right for you. So, uh, Ted, uh, you want to ask a, a couple of uh, poll questions at this point? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, James, if you don't mind, please. Okay, so the first is, do you have a high mix, low volume hardware? Please select a yes or a no answer to that. As you heard Tad talking about, that's that's a seemingly a, a you know a good candidate for uh, for a particular uh, use of AM. It'll take about another five or six seconds. Okay, it's a uh, a little better than half that say no. Uh, but uh, but almost half, as you can tell, 44% that of the respondents that uh, say that yes, they do have that kind of situation with their product. All right, is there another one, James? Okay, so do you do you manufacture complex parts or assemble multiple parts that could be combined into a single part? Yes or no, please. Okay, a couple more seconds. All right, let's take a look. So uh, yes, 57% say yes, that that is, uh, uh, again, that, that's another good set of candidates for, for AM. Um, okay, thanks for the polls there, James. Okay. So this, is, I'm just gonna touch base on where we are and, and who we are and what we do. So this will go pretty quick. So we can do some final questions at the end, okay? So we are based in Orlando, Florida, um, quite close to the Siemens Quads complex. In the bottom left picture is the uh, additive room where we do uh, uh, all of our manufacture from that perspective. The bottom right here are some of the parts. These are titanium uh, flow box parts for a, a gas turbine that we successfully made. The ones in the background are scaled versions that we can take to shows and so on and so forth. We sit within a larger innovation center and you're talking about robots and cobots. We have a, a number of different robots in our facility to uh, do a number of different activities. So, um, you know, uh, Sean, I thought you, you might like that. Um, but from an additive manufacturing perspective, we're located in a facility that can do a lot of post-processing for us. Full machining, we have engineering, we have lots of testing uh, and metrology um, from that perspective. And in the end, um, who are we and what do we do? Well, whether it's part identification, materials and process understanding, uh, help with design, um, maybe it's part selection, maybe it's modify or, or uh, uh, design for additive. If you have a factory and you're wanting to uh, put in two or three or four uh, additive manufacturing machines, what does it look like for EHS? What does it look for like for powder handling and homogenizing and things of that nature. We can help with that. And of course, our, our, our bread and butter is production, right? We, we are, we want to get into, and we are a, a zero production manufacturer of additive manufacturing parts worldwide. Now there's, there's just a small contingent of this in the U S 
And there's a, a quite another a large contingent uh, elsewhere in the world. Okay. Thanks, Tad. Um, I do have a question here for you, and it's it's actually similar to the one that uh, we had for Sean earlier. But you know, how, how do I get started in in figuring out how I can actually use additive manufacturing in production? You know, what are the biggest obstacles that I might might encounter in trying to uh, to to do the implementation? I think the biggest thing is is mindset, um, and you have to ask yourself: is 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 taking a part, for example, a plastic mock-up to a part to a meeting so you can hand it out to show what your capabilities are uh, before you go into an additive or even subtractive for that matter, um, uh, run for that particular part. I think it's, it's, it's getting people on board. Um, one of the largest problems that I have seen, at least within our company and others, is you, you get the, the, graybeard factor or or you get somebody saying i don't like that design because it looks weird and oftentimes they can't tell you why they don't like a design or don't like a particular part of the 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 additive process but it looks funny so therefore it may not must not work so i think it's it's really it's getting that 50.1 percent uh over the line to to open up to that possibility i think that's probably the biggest hurdle um, and then on, on from there is, well, ask, research, do a lot of, uh, uh, ask a lot of questions. Uh, I'm happy to help, uh, as well as uh, a lot of others out there. Uh, there's a lot of good resources from an additive manufacturing perspective. And really ask yourself uh, a, a lot of those questions that, that uh, I had post, put up there. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Let's get to the next slide, James. There it is. Okay, um, and actually to the next one too. Um, if you have um, if you have any questions or or you want more information about any of these um, of the issues that we've we've talked about here today, the two tech, two types of technologies, uh, please uh, just give us a give us a call. You can contact us um, and and contact uh, your business advisor in uh, in your region. James, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to get that. That we are coming to the to the end of our time here, and I, I did have one more question I wanted to ask uh, um, Sean, if you if you can, if you don't mind. Um, this I thought this is a pretty good question. You know, how can I prevent my employees from being resentful, you know, or resenting the automation, or you know, thinking that the the robot will take my job? You know, we saw you, Sean, talk about that. That it's the facts actually contradict that kind of a mindset, but but uh, but you know how do you get over that if it still exists? Yeah, um, what we found is uh, involving your employees in the process, involving the the, the operators in the process of of um, specking the equipment. Uh, what do you want it to do? How do you want it to look? Um, do you want product to come in this way and go out the same direction, or do you want it to you know be a racetrack type, type machine? Um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, manufacturing engineers are really smart guys, and then they walk out on the floor, and the operators will go like, "Well, that's not how we do it. We do it this way." Um, so you got to learn from the employees from from that perspective. Include them in the process. We invite them to the FAT, our factory acceptance test. We want them to come see the equipment here, so that when it shows up on the floor, it's not just some strange piece of equipment that's being forced upon them, but they've actually had input into how the machine is going to be built or how it's going to be designed or where the buttons are going to be and where the touch screen is going to be and things like that um, so that when it hits their floor um, it, it's not this unknown entity it's it's something that they're familiar with and they're interested in and, and they can't wait for it to start producing products so um, just include include your operators and your and your factory workers you know in that process that's probably the, the best advice i've ever Okay, great. Very thank you very much, Sean and and, and Tad both for uh, your participation today and, and making your presentations. And thank you, James, for your, the support that you've provided to us today. Uh, that brings our webinar to a close. Um, as noted earlier, the uh, the recording of the webinar will be uh, uh, provided to all the attendees. Um, we do have a, a couple of uh, upcoming webinars, as you can see there on the screen. The Florida Makes Industrial Manufacturing Technician Program is being kicked off 
on uh, July 7th and on the 16th, uh, Visit Success Through Environmental Sustainability. So both of those are upcoming uh, this month. Um, I wanna thank all the participants for attending today. And uh, please, as you exit the webinar, we ask that you complete the survey. Uh, we do seek your feedback continuously about how to improve and better meet your needs. Um, once again, thank you, John. Thank you, Tad. And uh, hope everyone has a, has a good uh, holiday weekend. Thank you. Thank you.